Over 25 years, he's worked as an independent historic building consultant and since 1999 has served with Adam Architecture, which has been involved in the restoration of many well-known historical buildings. Dan's presentation this afternoon is one that's very close to my heart, and that's the history of clay architecture. Thank you, Dan Cruchet. I'm looking back, um, well, more like 5,000 years, a celebration of clay as a building material. I, 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 um, I love clay. I suppose most people in this room love clay, have worked with clay. I've worked with it as a child. I love the, just the texture, the feeling of clay as, well, as one, you know, knocks it into shape. It's a wonderful thing. And um, it's, I'm delighted to have a, a chance to indulge my passion and talk about clay for the next hour or so. Um, and I suppose, I suppose it's sort of like alchemy, isn't it? Uh, the transformation through, you know, with fire of, 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 of earth and water into building products that endure, that are beautiful. We've heard a lot about endurance is absolutely true because some of my earliest examples certainly go back I say about 5,000 years. Um, so, there's a magic, there's a magic about it, and I, and I say a beauty. The, the, what's, in, obviously, what's so interesting, I suppose, one of many interesting things about, about brick building, brick technology, brick history, is of course different cultures, it's different locations, develop similar ideas, similar technologies. This is um, a rather extraordinary place in Peru, which is um, the, sort of the largest um, um, sun-dried brick structure in the world, I suppose, Huacalonga, Tukeme in Peru, uh, built probably um, initially um, about 2,000 years ago. That great mound is not a natural feature. It's a brick-built pyramid, uh, eroded, abandoned, like many things, undermined by the, the Spanish um, conquerors in the 16th century. But there it is, a vast, a vast creation of adobe bricks. Obviously, the problem about brick making anciently was, it was, was achieving a heat, sustaining a heat for a given period of time, and controlling it. Because, of course, products, brick, uh, water made products, shrink under fire naturally. But you've got to control, estimate, and control the shrinkage to perfection to create this. Because here is Marduk. Look at the number of bricks he's made out of. And, and these are made in moulds, fired and shrink. But each one has to shrink the same amount, or the thing won't work. So an incredible example of a really um, amazing technological achievement to create this image of this dragon. And um, this, this one is probably not so familiar, because the more familiar ones are, this is just a detail, to wonder for a moment. Look at the, I mean, that someone's calculated the shrinkage and got it right. Incredibly interesting. What they use for fuel? I must have been some sort of charcoal. Can't be coal. Pitch, tar, bitumen. So I was mentioning so the, how bricks develop. So we have these uh, 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 um, sun dried bricks, and then obviously kiln dried and tiles, glaze, fantastic. All of this is, you know, 2,600 years ago and earlier. But the structures are are quite relatively simple. You know, bricks laid as piers. I say massive compressive strength, but spans are, are a problem. So that's where engineering comes in. That's where the Romans come in, of course. Now, just one or two examples of Roman brick building, just seeing how, uh, how, how the brick was, was, was transformed by greater understanding of the, of the nature of structure and, and, and the possibilities of, of, of various forms, giving strength and greater spans through design, through design. The Pantheon, of course, in Rome is a wonderful example of brick construction, engineered brick construction. The Pantheon, as you now see it, about 1,200 AD, reconstructed after a fire. The great portico, monolithic Egyptian granite columns, that's fine, but of course it's a brick that's amazing. Originally, the whole of the uh, Pantheon was clad with marble, so the brick structure you can now see was not meant to be seen, but my goodness, a wonderful example of engineered construction because it has this great dome, and all domes push outwards lateral, very great problem to, with, to withstand the, the, the outer thrust of a dome. And here it's done not just through thickness of wall, but by having the idea of thrust and counter thrust, by having arches, 
uh, within, within the, the brick structure to get to a, a, a brick dome. And brick domes are, of course, one of the great and exciting structural things. One can choose many. I've chosen um, 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 Air Sophia in, in Istanbul. A little bit later, of course, the 520s. Here it is, Great Christian Church. Um, really interesting that the span of, 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 of the uh, Pantheon was, was, was it, um, 43 metres, a diameter of the dome of the Pantheon. But here, this, 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 this was, of course, the Pantheon became this great model to emulate. The Pantheon, a pagan building, gets made into a, a church quite early on. And the great churches and the great mosques tend to emulate the Pantheon. The Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem is a version trying to recreate the Pantheon in Rome. It becomes a great model for massive sacred buildings. A dome in the rock, on the rock in a uh, uh, mosque in, in Jerusalem. Again, it's, it's a smaller version of the Pantheon. And this, of course, the Hagia Sophia, was the great Pantheon built in the Eastern Roman Empire. The Pantheon's in Rome, so you have a great dome structure, and it's going to be bigger. But it, this is all brick. It's the most amazing construction. Always had trouble from the start. Um, so this dome is um, um, uh, about the same size, actually, but, but, but the whole structure is much bigger. But, but this dome is brick, not concrete. My, I mean, the most exciting, I suppose, brick structure I've in a way ever seen, um, because this is the minaret at Jam. This is central Afghanistan. A minaret, um, tiny brick built, that is built probably 1174 by the Gurid, is Gurid Empire, a victory tower or a minaret in the centre of their summer capital, being nomadic. There were no roads, not necessary, and it's very mountainous, very hard to get to. They would have had tents and yurts on plateaus, but in, this, in Lowdown, in the Sacred Valley, stands this incredible thing, this victory tower or minaret, brick built, intact. Um, with glazed, uh, some, some blue glazed bricks and covered with lettering. The bottom part is, the, I think, the, the 14th surah of the Quran, the one that proclaims Maryam and Jesus as great people. So, you know, obviously the Quran is very keen on Jesus and Mary. So, in a sense, it's a text that seems to speak about the people of the different books coming together. But where these bricks came from, no one knows. They're beautifully made. There's no brick earth in this area. They had to be transported huge distance and then erected with the, the utmost skill to, to create well, this Kufic lettering uh, around the, the, the outer surface of the minaret. Just worth a moment just looking at the, the delicacy and the precision, but again, only possible with beautifully made uh, kiln dry brick. I should say, I've travelled a lot, as I, as I keep saying, but. I'm a huge fan of English brickwork. I would say there's very few places in the world that can compete with first-rate English brickwork of the late 17th uh, and 18th century. Many examples. That, Holland is, is an inspiration, and, and much of the, um, I suppose, English artistic taste came from Holland in the late 17th century. So did the tradition of brick to many, and pantiles and so on. You see Dutch and Germany. But the quality and the workmanship it's amazing, and often, if you think of that workmanship in the context of how brick buildings were made, around Spitalfields here, I lived just a few moments from here, um, I can tell you, if you yes, I think you'll be, what are you doing after this? Oh, I'm going to a little bit of a walk, but there are some amazingly good buildings, early 18th century buildings, if you, around Fournier Street near Christchurch, the great Hawksmoor Church, and on those you'll see what great brickwork, which I'll show you an image of in a moment. But Spitalfield, what's left of it, those houses were built as, as ruthless acts of speculation in the early 18th century by um, local builders uh, working with local landlords, houses built quickly and cheaply to make maximum profit. It all sounds horribly familiar, doesn't it? But, of course, they created works of art, almost by accident, and works of great craftsmanship. What's fascinating is that this great brickwork I'm about to show you some examples of was achieved in these strangely unpromising circumstances of greed and, and, and financial insecurity. Last thing, really, was, I suppose, to go back to where we started, was about um, the one last subject, tiles. Why this, why um, Wienerberger interests me is because they do make traditional tiles. Obviously, there are issues of relating traditional 
tile detailing to, I suppose, solar panels. I don't know whether that will maybe talk about it later on, but to what degree, you know, um, tiles that, 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 that are, are contemporary can fit with ancient buildings is, is, is an interesting subject. But, I mean, if one's repairing an old building, there are very few suppliers of, um, of, 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 of traditional building material, traditional tiles, and this company does well. And, I, and I've, in other guys, I've worked with, um, with the company on a repair job down the road of the early 19th century buildings on, in Whitechapel. And I've got some images here. These are rather sort of tiles. But um, you know, just to get pan tiles now to repair an old building is really hard. Uh, you can get second-hand pan tiles, but they don't lock together because that's a problem. Profiles vary. To get a supplier uh, that can you know, give enough pan tiles, enough flat tiles to do a, a large conservation scheme, and, you, and the old tiles have gone, you can't get second-hand ones, proved incredibly hard. But in the end, the Spitalfields Trials, through Santoff, found a supply of, of brilliant tiles that made um, a repair of a very humdrum set of buildings. These are not listed, uh, 1900, 1800, by the London Hospital. That's the before picture. But with these you know, beautiful tiles from Santoff, uh, made the buildings look absolutely wonderful. And so, you know, having had that experience of working with the products produced by uh, Santoff and Weinberger, I, I was um, very, I say, delighted to, uh, to come along and chat about the history of clay ending with roof tiles. Sorry to go on Thank so you. much. Stop there. Oh, <laughs>